Today I'm going to preach from Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14. This is a very critical piece of this scripture. And it takes us through one of the greatest prayers. Paul prayed two prayers. He prayed one, well he prayed many. I think he prayed 18 different prayers of the word. But he prayed uh, two critical ones in the book of Ephesians. In the end of the chapter 1 and in the end of chapter 3. And so we're going to look into this today and read this text with me from Ephesians 3.14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bow your heads with me. Father, I thank you today for your word. Your word is rich. Your word is real. Your word applies to our life. Your word is the central theme that gives us not only hope for an eternal life, but faith that during this walk on earth that your word being manifest to us will bless us and keep us in this day. Now, Father, I thank you today for these that have come this way, and I appreciate their faithfulness. And I pray today, God, that you would open their eyes that they could see their ears that they can hear, their heart that they can understand what the Word of God has, is saying to, to them, and then that that understanding would bring the ability to apply the Word of God directly to their life and change them, transform them, conform them to the image of your dear Son. I pray today, God, that as always here, you would speak to us through the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit would minister in a great way by His Word and grip the hearts and lives of your people so that we can not only be blessed, but that we can be strengthened, so that we can not only be strengthened, but we can be encouraged, not only encouraged, but comforted by the fact that God is still God. And we bow our knee to God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. And you may be seated. You know, my father left us in 1996. He was a great guy. My dad was probably one of the most loving human beings that ever walked the face of the earth, particularly when it came to, to his children. When I was a child... I spent a lot of time. My father was a workaholic. I wasn't. I was an athlete and a player. I liked to play. But when I was a little kid, I would follow my dad around incessantly and watch what he does. One of the greatest memories that I have is my father building a house for us in Parkersburg, West Virginia. And playing while he dug the footer of that house and watching him go to work all day long, come home at night and take a shovel. He literally dug the footer of the house with a shovel. Him and his father. And I remember watching them do their work and thinking, boy, that, that, that guy, he knows what he's doing. Do you know that that house is footer had to be deeper on the front end than the back end because it was built into a hill. So it had to be graded and planed just perfectly so the footer would be right. So the foot He just knew what he was doing. As I grew up, my father became a car man and he sold cars. And I watched him fix everything and anything you could imagine on a car. My Lord... He could do brakes. He could take an engine apart. He could fix the tires. He could fix the muffler. He could fix the body. He could fix the interior. He could do it all. There was nothing my daddy couldn't do, I'm telling you. Then I watched him lay cement and lay block and do brick and do brick. And then my daddy was also a carpenter. He could build the nicest cabinets you've ever laid your eyes on. He, there was nothing that my daddy couldn't do. He could do it all. He was on the town council. He, he took care of all of the maintenance of the city, plus worked his job. My dad was a newspaper man, ran management in newspaper and had his own. My dad could do absolutely anything that, it was, called, that was called for. 
If that light fixture broke, my dad could fix it. it. Didn't make any difference. You'd say, Dad, what do you know about that? Well, I don't yet. That'd be what he'd say. I don't yet. See, didn't make any difference what it was. He, he could do it. And if Mom was here, Mom would tell you that when my father built that house, the last house that he built in, in North Carolina, the thing was so unlevel that people looked at it and said, Bob, how are you going to do that? He crawled down underneath, took a car jack, and leveled that house with a car jack. They said, Bob, how are you going to fix that high two-story siding? He said, he'd say, come on, don't you worry about that. I, 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 I'll do it. I, I. And so he put a, a, a ladder in the back of a pickup truck and broke, pulled himself up and, and put brand new siding all the way around that house. They said, Bob, you got leaks in the roof. How are you going to do that? He took a higher ladder and went up on top, painted it, tarred it, would stand up there and survey the land like he was the king of all he could see. My dad could do anything. He could do it anywhere. He could do it anytime. Didn't make any difference what it was. My dad could get it done. Period. And we as children, well, my dad could do it. I could play ball. I didn't learn one thing about fixing anything. As a matter of fact, at my house when something broke, the kids, I would be sitting in the chair, something would break, they'd run by me with it in their hand. I'd be sitting right there, they'd be hollering, Mom, Mom, because I can't fix nothing. I, I had no ability to do anything in the mechanical realm. As a matter of fact, my wife came home the other day with a uh, pergola. And uh, I looked at the pergola and I said, can't be done. Can't be done. Not for me. Not for you. So we called in our amazing friend who's, who's big enough to go under that table without bumping his head. And he put that pergola together just like that. And I served as his apprentice. I did screw some nails and hold some stuff for him. And that wasn't in that right. I didn't do very much, did it? Huh? Screw the nails. Well, there you have it. See what I mean? I screwed the nails. Bless God, my wife caught me in that, didn't she? But Paul is here talking about, for this cause I bow my knee unto the Father. I have an earthly father that could do anything at any time. If I wanted him to hit balls, tell me he'd hit balls. If I wanted him to tell me how to hit a baseball, he could tell me. If I wanted him to umpire my baseball game, he could do it. My dad could do it all. Paul is here looking and saying, For this cause I bow my knee unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And listen to the Amplified Classic. For this reason, seeing the greatness of this plan by which you are built together in Christ, I bow my knees before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what he's saying. He's saying in full view of the inexhaustible, fathomless, and endless grace of God, Seeing the greatness of the plan of grace to use favor, privilege, influence, and the way God does things to minister the grace of God to all who believe on the name of the Son of God. Then he says, in full picture of that, I bow my knee. You see, Paul was bowing his knee to a God that could do anything anywhere, anytime, by any means required because He is the God of the universe. He is Elohim, the Creator of all mankind. He is Elohim of Genesis chapter 1 that spoke into existence life and every creature and every creation that was made. And when it got to verse 26 and 27, Elohim spoke and said, Let us make man in our image. And man was birthed from the dust and he spoke into a spirit and man became to be the creation of the Elohim God. The creation of the Father, the creation of the Son, the creation of the Holy Spirit that could do everything and anything everywhere and every time. What a mighty God Paul has bowed his knee to. That's the God 
we serve, ladies and gentlemen. Now, Paul said, I bow my knee to the Father who has accomplished. Look at Jeremiah 29, 11 and 12. Now, watch this God that we serve. This Elohim, and I've mentioned this, but I want to go back to this. Elohim means the plural God. The God that is the Father, the God that is the Son, and the God that is the Holy Spirit. Elohim was the God that spoke the world into existence. Did you ever think how close God made you to Himself? Let me show you. He made every animal and He made every bird. He made every tree. He made every vegetation. He cast the light into the darkness and light was. He did that by speaking. Did you ever think that when God made you in His own image, you're the only creation God ever created that had the ability to use your voice to speak? That's how close you are to Him. I bow my knee to Him today because God put me in a class with Himself. He said, let us make man after our own image. And in the image of God, He created He male and female. And they begin to speak the language of dominion just like Elohim did. Just like the plural God did. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that were speaking into creation. Church, I bow my knee today because I, after the image of God, the plural Elohim, have the ability to create, have the ability to have dominion, have the ability to defeat the enemy, have the ability to be an overcomer, because Elohim is living in me, and because of that, I am more than an overcomer because of Elohim. What a wonderful thing to know Paul said, in it, or Jeremiah said, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Have you ever thought about that? God is thinking about you, Carleen. God spends time thinking about you. You know why we know that? Because for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God is thinking thoughts about you. So therefore, I bow my knee before the Father and say, God, whatever thoughts you're thinking about me today, teach me today what you're thinking about me. Listen to the word. Say of the Lord. And listen what He's thinking about you, Travis. He's thinking about your peace. He's thinking about how can I get Travis to bow the knee to me so that I can give Travis peace. Do you know that God's idea and God's ideal in Israel was that when Israel said the word shalom, peace, they were saying it is a God delivered, a God given, it is a God mantle that is given to Israel by Elohim that we would live and walk in peace under that name. He's thinking the same thoughts about you, church. You're not being left out. He said, I know the thoughts I'm thinking about you and they're thoughts for peace. They're not thoughts for evil. Now watch this next bold. To give you an expected end. My father went into the house and he began to dig the footers. Why was he digging the footers? Because without the footers, there would be no house. He had to dig the footers. Sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, in this life, you have to go through the footers of life and the pains of life and the trials of life and the torment of life and the troubles of life and the hurt of life and the upset of life. And you have to walk through the footers and dig the footers. But there's an end that's coming, ladies and gentlemen. And the expected end is that there will be peace. What we want to do is we want to have the house without digging the foot. Huh? We want to have the car without understanding it's got to have tires. 
And they may have to be changed. We want to have the good things of life. All the blessings of God. Never understanding that to get to those blessings, there's going to come a path and there's going to come a walk and there's going to come a time when you're going to have to get down in the dirt and do some dirty work to get yourself to an expected end. We all want it easy. Glory to God. He said that I know the thoughts that I have for you. Now I want you to get that. And they are to bring you to an expected end. What are you expecting from God? And the bigger question is, what are you willing to work for to bring about that expected end? Now the disciples, they expected that Jesus would build a kingdom as the Messiah in their midst. They did not understand, recognize, nor realize that God in Jesus was not building an earthly kingdom on the spot. He was going to build a cross. And on that cross, the kingdom would begin, but they didn't get that. He said to them, I am going to go to the cross. And Peter said, Nay, Lord. No, that can't be. There cannot be a footer for you to walk. There can't be a shovel for you to dig. There can't be a problem for you to go through. No, my Lord. And Jesus turned around to the man that wanted it now and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. I want you to think about that just a second. God was bringing them to an expected end, but it was the end God expected. Not the end you expect. It's the end God's trying to perpetrate. It's the end God's trying to bring about for your life. And it will never come. The Bible said that Jesus Christ was, did not even have a place to lay his head, ladies and gentlemen. It did not come without trial. It did not come without travail. It did not come without him facing the devil. It did not come without him overcoming the world. It did not come without people persecuting him. It did not come without the world saying, kill him and crucify him. But it brought it to an expected end that was prophesied in Genesis chapter 3 that there would come a man born of woman who would stomp the head of the devil and that cross came about to an expected end and now we reign in life by Christ Jesus. Give the Lord a hand in that way. Now watch the next verse. Then shall you call upon me. When? When you understand that I, my plan for you is not for evil. It's for good. It's for peace. It's for life. Then shall you call upon me. When you understand that God is working in you in favor and God is working in you in privilege and God is working in you in influence and God is working in you in the way He does things. <coughs> and when you get to that point where you understand what God is doing, where you understand how God is thinking about you, where you understand the grace of God that fills your life and changes you and conforms you to the image. When you understand that, the Bible said, Then shall you pray, and I will hearken unto you. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 7, Paul merited that by saying that you would have boldness when you pray, access and confidence in Him by the faith of what Jesus did for you on Calvary Street. Church, there is a place for you to understand the thoughts of God, to understand that when you now call upon Him because of grace and bow your knee to the Son of Almighty God because of grace, by grace through faith, that in that place there is peace and God will hearken to you and to your voice and to your needs because it is done by grace through faith. And Paul said that the faith that would bring you is the very faith of Jesus Christ and what he did on Calvary's tree. Can't get
it around. Can't get over. Can't get under. Can't get through it. This plan was birthed in grace. It was birthed in the grace of God. It was birthed in favor. It was birthed in privilege. It was birthed in God's influence. It was birthed in the way God did take. And Jesus took that birth and wrapped that birth in His own blood. And the Bible said, and they overcame Him, the devil, by the word of the testimony and by the blood of the Lamb of God. My friend, the cross today still speaks and the blood still works and it cries out from the portals of glory and it says to every man that will bow his knee for this cause to the Father and to Jesus Christ that the blood sets you free and the blood gives you life and the blood gives you peace because it is God's thought that the blood would be the separator. When I see the blood, the song said, you've heard it, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Glory to God, give the Lord a hand clap of praise for the blood of Jesus Christ. Except you think, oh, wait a minute, I, I'm not talking the right language, you should have corrected me. The blood made you free. The blood made you free, it didn't set you free. Because as we know, if the blood had set me free, I could stand to be caught again. But the blood has made me free. It made me by force something that I could not be. It broke the legal bonds of Satan and set me, made me free. And if I'm free, bless God, I'm free by grace indeed now and throughout eternity, eternity to live the life that God has planned, that God has thought about me. Amen. See, He thinks about me. He thinks about you, friend. God's thinking about you. What's He thinking about me, Pastor? He's thinking, I see the blood. I see the blood. When Paul Frank calls on God, Jesus turns and says, That's old Frank. I see the blood. I see grace burst in him. I see him wrapped in the blood. I see Frank bow his knee because of that grace and that blood to the Father and to Jesus Christ. God, I hear him. Look what the word said. And I'm singing in peace. Now, how many of you would say to me today, preacher, I, I, I need peace in my life. I need peace. I need peace in my spirit. I need peace in my soul. I need peace in my flesh. I need peace in my home. I need peace on my job. I need peace of mind. Well, listen to what the Word said. God, in His thoughts about you, has said to you that I'm planning my plan for you and my thoughts about you is that when you call upon me, I'll hear and I'll give you the very thing you're looking for and that peace will transform you out of darkness, Colossians 1.13, into the glorious kingdom of His dear Son. That's what God thinks about you. That name, now watch this now because remember I told you about Elohim? That name, now look at Ephesians 3.15 with me. Because this is critical. This is what grace did for you ladies and gentlemen. Watch what Paul said. For whom every family in heaven and earth is named. Have you ever considered the fact Really, that you were named after the God of glory. God of glory, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Creator God, the God of strength 
and the boss of authority is who you are named after. You are Rita Thomas Elohim. Huh? You're full of the created power of God because you were made in God's image. And the name by the grace of God has named you and adopted you into the family of Elohim. And Elohim, the creator, with strength and all authority, is your Abba Father, my dear Paul. That's why Paul bowed. It was for that reason that Paul said, I can't go any higher than God. I can't be any higher than with God. I can't know more than to know God. I can't be any better in this life than to know God. They can't give me enough money that would be more than to know the Elohim of Genesis chapter 1. They can't give me a big enough car to drive. I bow my knee to the Father and Jesus Christ, the Elohim of creation, the Elohim of strength, the Elohim of authority, that every family in heaven and earth is named after, have you ever considered who you are? Now we talk a lot around here about being in Christ. We're in Christ, church. There's no doubt about that. But we are in the family of God. Paul bowed his knee to God. By grace I bow before God. By grace I bow before the God of heaven and earth. By grace I bow before the one that Jesus said himself, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You're so big, God, that we bow before you today and simply say thank you. Thank you for the air we breathe and the life we live. Thank you for the job we have. Thank you, Lord, for the footer I have to build, for the trouble I have to go through, for the disturbance in my life. Thank you, God, for an unruly husband. Thank you, God, for an unruly wife. Thank you, God, for an unruly house. Thank you, God, because you, God, are named after your name, and as long as I'm after your name, everything's going to be all right. So, everything's going to be all right. That name, now watch this now, because this is gripping. That name has kept you. You didn't see it. There have been many hours when you had literally stood and said, God, where are you? What are you doing, God? Why is this happening to me, God? How come I'm going through this, God? Why does this hurt so bad, God? Why am I struggling with this, God? God, you're God. You could fix this thing in the snap of a finger or the blink of an eye. You can do it, God. I don't understand why you're not. I don't understand why you won't. And the next thing that comes out of your mouth is maybe, maybe my sin is keeping me from you. The next thing that comes out of your mouth is, God, do you really love me? Do you really care enough about me? Don't you see that I'm hurting? Don't you see that I'm in trouble? Don't you see that I'm sinking? Don't you understand, God? This is a hard time for me. I need you, God, to show up. And then Jesus turned to the disciples who said every bit of that and more. And this is what he prayed in John 17, 12. He said, while I, Jesus, was with them in the world, I have kept them, how? In your, thy name. Ladies and gentlemen, you are here today as a testimony to how I overcame. You're here today as a testimony to how the devil has not won. You're here today in the name of Jesus as a testimony to the fact that Elohim, Jehovah, the Jireh of Israel has brought you out and kept you by His name. You should be bowing your knee to the Father of glory and His wondrous Son, Jesus Christ, for by grace you have come through the storm. By grace you have overcome. By grace you are alive. By grace you're breathing.
moving again. By grace you're moving on. And by grace you're going to inherit the kingdom of Almighty God. Hallelujah. Huh? He said, I've kept them. They murmured. They struggled. They took the footer. Huh? But I've kept them. And I've always kept them the same way. I didn't use many vast and different variances to keep them. You know why? You know why God keeps you by His name? God keeps you by His name because the Word of God said there is no variableness in it, neither shadow of turn. His name worked in Genesis 1, and it works in the end of the book of Revelation. And it works at all points in between. That's why His name kept them. His name kept them just like it keeps you. Now, in the middle of all of this, the disciples went for many times. They were out on the boat in the middle of the storm, and they said to Him, Don't you care that we perish? And He stood up in that name and calmed the sea. Don't you know that while they went along during their time, they had many, many, many struggles and trial. They came to the point where the 5,000 needed food, and they said, We ain't got none. And along came Jesus and said to them, Take what you have, and He blessed it. And they went and fed 5,000 people. God has kept you by His name, even when you lived outright opposition to God. Even when you were rebellious. Even whenever you said and did things that you knew hurt people. Even when you didn't give to God like you should have given to God. Even when you haven't attended church like you knew you should have attended church. Even when you had a bad attitude. Even when you wanted and picked a fight with others. God by His name has still kept you. God by His love has still loved you. God by His inseparable, unfathomable, bull, exhaustless, Grace of God, the unsearchable riches of God has brought you to this moment in time for you to have the opportunity to bow your knee by grace to the Father of glory and His wonderful Son that gave Himself for you and died to make you the righteousness of God. You get the church. That man by grace has provided answers. He's provided answers for you. To every need. Jesus said these words in John 16 through 23. He said, ask the Father in my name. And He will give it to you. In the name of Jesus. Do you know this week I was praying. Something struck me that I'm going to share with you. The name of Jesus is the entrance into the supernatural. The name of Jesus is the entrance into the supernatural. Why do you say that? Because Jesus said, in my name you'll cast out devils. Tell me that's not supernatural. In my name you'll speak with new tongues. Tell me that's not supernatural. In my name you'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Tell me that's not supernatural. And then he said, and the Lord worked with them. Where did he work with them? He worked with them in the supernatural. Begin to call the name of Jesus against the powers and the struggles and the turmoils of life. Begin to bow yourself before God. And by that name and through that name, by Elohim, strength, authority, and creative ability, God is going to bring you out. And there will be no way for you to look at your circumstances and say, under any other condition was I made free, but by the name of the Son of God. Watch. That name by grace has given us the riches of His glory. That name by grace has given us the riches of His glory. Now church, I'm closing with this. But I want you to hear it. Ephesians 3.16 said that He would grant you, give you upon your request, Once you were included in the family, He would give you upon your request according to the riches of His beauty, power, and purpose. 
Here's the thing about grace. Grace always works through faith. And the Word of God said this. He said He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Well, what is He rewarding you with? Well, glory to God, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Sounds good, doesn't it? thing about it is, is that according to this, the granting of His riches, according to the riches of His glory, His beauty, power, and purpose, is the reward of faith. And when you believe, and you believe that you receive, the riches of Almighty God, His beauty, power, and purpose are made manifest to you. Paul said it's done by the manifold wisdom of God. Now you get his clothes right. Today I want to ask you, are you ready to bow your knee to the Father. Because by grace He's made you free. By grace He's given you salvation. By grace He's given you preservation, soundness, healing. By grace He's given you safety. By grace He's saved you. Salvation has come to you. Are you ready to bow your knee? For the Bible said that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that Jesus is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Are you bowing before Him today? Or is it life as usual for you? Are you just going along with life as it is, never understanding that your life is being kept by the name of God through Jesus Christ by His blood and you're so fast about your business that you don't come to the point where you get out and walk in the foot with Him. Where you get out in the dirt and you walk with God. And you bow your knee before Him. You bow your heart before Him. You bow your life before Him. Because the Word of God said, I know what I think of you. I thought enough about you that I sent my Son to die so that you could live. Now you're going to choose life. You're going to choose peace. You're going to choose joy. You're going to choose communion with God. Or you're going to choose a life that is contrary to the thoughts of God about you. God thought enough about you. He thought enough about what He had made. He thought enough about His image that He made a way for you. I want you to think on that a minute. And He said, if you'll bow because of what I've done for you, I'll build in you a temple. I'll build a new house in you. And that new house is where I will dwell with you. For you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Christ dwells in you, Paul wrote. But we get so busy with ourselves that we never bow. Paul said, for this reason, for this cause, because of what Christ did for me and through me, I bow today. I bow because I'm named after Him. I bow today because He loved me when I was unlovable. 
I bow today because He's giving me glory unspeakable and full of glory. I bow today because of that wonderful grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I 
I thank you today for being here. 